Uh, we've joked for years that my wife doesn't put on weight. In fact, my earliest memory of her, uh, which was at college, is uh, seeing her every single day at the sort of morning break with a can of Coke in one hand and a donut in the other. This was every single day. And I can say this with certainty because I was trying to sort of chat to her or unsuccessfully flirt with her every single day. Now, even now at six months pregnant, uh, she has kept within the healthy weight guidelines, but the only obvious visual change to her body is really just in her belly. Now, her whole family seems to share this trait. Her father remains very slim at the age of 70, despite eating dessert after what seems like every single meal. And her brother can eat about as much as I can, despite the fact that I outweigh him by about 20 or 30 kilos. Now, I, on the other hand, have to watch what I eat. Uh, just a few days of lax eating, and the difference is really obvious. My mother is the same, and you can see the trend running through our family. So the question begs to be asked, why is this the case? Now, I wanted to impress that one of the reasons I wanted to address this question is because I have written and spoken quite honestly about the nature of obesity, particularly recently about the new research which reveals obesity emerging as a risk factor for COVID-19. And I really wanted to clarify that I'm fully aware of and have empathy for the difficulties many people face in trying to lose weight. In fact, this is one of the reasons I went into this profession. Um, these are difficulties I myself have faced and had to contend with throughout my life. So when we talk about any change in weight, weight loss, weight maintenance, weight gain, we can't help but avoid the calories in versus calories out weight loss equation. You've heard me harp on about this in previous videos and, and uh, in articles. Now, this is based on the laws of thermodynamics. So energy can't be created or destroyed. It simply changes from one state to another. Simple, right? So if somebody is gaining stored energy in the form of body fat, that energy isn't being created out of nowhere. It must be being converted from another state, in, i.e. food or drink calories. Um, now, as I've discussed in other videos and articles, in many cases, this is all you need to achieve changes in body mass. It's simply an issue of getting the numbers right. However, this is definitely not the whole picture. Generally speaking, our body weight is a complex interaction between three different forces. The first is the environment in which we live, the second is our genes, and the third is our behaviors. So from the get-go, you can see why things can be difficult. We can do little to change our environment, and we can't change our genes. So the only one of the three factors we can really influence is our behavior. And the extent to which you need to control your behavior to elicit some sort of positive change will be influenced largely by the other two factors. So if you're in, in, in an environment of, uh, that promotes really good health and you have what we call quote unquote good genes, your results will likely come quite easily. However, if you're in an environment that doesn't promote good health and perhaps your genes aren't particularly favorable for you know, body weight maintenance, you know, the situation is much gonna, gonna be much more difficult for you. So I want to talk about hormones, which turns out aren't just troublesome in puberty, as many of us experienced. Um, the body has various homo homeostatic mechanisms to keep things in balance. I haven't been able to say that word since I was a teenager. Um, homeostatic mechanisms. Uh, thermoregulation for when you're hot and cold or respiratory regulation for when you need more oxygen. Um, now, it turns out regulation of body weight is no different. It is a, a little more complicated than this, but generally an increase in fat mass tends to be accompanied by increases in the hormone leptin, which decreases appetite. And conversely, reductions in body fat mass tend to be accompanied by increases in the hormone ghrelin, which increases appetite. 
So as you can see, the body has this homeo homeostatic mechanism um, to prevent you, try and prevent you from either gaining or losing too much weight. Now, if our appetite was solely regulated by these homeostatic mechanisms, we would only ever eat and drink to meet our caloric needs and then stop. Now, this obviously isn't the case. Now, our brain also receives input from these so-called hedonic pathways, which can override the homeostatic mechanisms that I've just mentioned. So these pathways relate to stimuli, st stimuli like sight or smell or taste, as well as the emotional and social factors that are often linked to eating behavior. Now, when I want to explain this to someone sort of simply and quickly, I talk about the extra stomach that we have for dessert, uh, even when we couldn't have eaten another bite of our main course. Um, the lure of the taste and sight and smell of that delicious food uh, that, is the homeo uh, that is the hedonic pathway overriding the homeostatic mechanisms. Um, now, the hypothesis is that these pathways were useful when food was scarce. So when our ancestors found an abundance of food, they, would, uh, they could override their mechanisms of satiation and overconsume in, in order to then be better off when they had no food available. However, transfer this mechanism into our current obesogenic environment and you really have a recipe for, for trouble. Most of us, or a great majority of us, are lucky enough to find ourselves never in a situation of food scarcity. So these hedonic pathways only serve to work against us. Now on top of this, when an individual has spent a long time being overweight or obese, their body can tend to find a new state of homeostasis. This means their, basic, their basal metabolic rate, BMR, the amount of calories they use at rest, and hormonal profile settle at this new higher body mass. So when the individual loses weight, the body reacts as if the individual is in a way starving and then kicks in the homeostatic mechanisms outlined before namely the increase in ghrelin, which is stimulating appetite. Now, this is why people who are losing weight often feel extremely hungry, even if they are consuming near sufficient calories and just getting rid of excess body fat. Further to this, it has been shown that obese people can become leptin resistant. So the feedback loop that decreases appetite in response to increases in fat mass can weaken or disappear entirely. We also now recognize uh, that some individuals have a genetic susceptibility that impairs that negative feedback loop system uh, of body mass and leptin. So you have these two factors working against someone. They are genetically um, have a resistance to the effects of leptin, which causes them to increase, more easily increase their body mass and then on top of that, the, the obesity causes them to become even more leptin resistant, causing uh, further increases in body mass. So unfortunately, life isn't fair and neither is biology, so we shouldn't expect it to be. A reduction in energy expenditure can also play a role. Um, when we lose weight, our BMR, basic metabolic rate, drops, therefore necessitating the ingestion of even fewer calories to continue or even maintain that weight loss. Um, this is due to two primary reasons. Firstly is the thyroid, uh, thyroid hormone T4 is converted to the inactive reverse T3 instead of normal T3, causing a reduction in energy expenditure. And of course, the reduction in mass, particularly any loss of lean muscle tissue, reduces energy output. So for example, if you weigh 100 kilos and lose weight consuming, say, 3,000 calories a day, once you drop below a certain weight, say 90 kilos, for example, your intake will, this intake of 3,000 calories will no longer have you in a calorie deficit due to these changes in BMR. So you will then need to reduce calories even further to continue losing weight, as the same deficit will no longer work. So what's the consequence of all of this? Well, 
the calories in and calories out equation still technically holds or still technically works, but the calories out pro, uh, portion becomes increasingly decreased and your hormonal profile is screaming at you to put more calories in. So achieving a state of energy balance following a period of deliberate energy restriction and weight loss therefore uh, pre presents a formidable challenge, meaning that people tend to put weight back on, which is why we see so many examples of people losing weight and then over a not particularly long period of time, they just simply put the weight back on. Now, for some good news, finally, you don't need to make massive changes to see some really meaningful benefits. For example, this study shows that weight loss of as little as 5 to 10% five to can result in clinically significant improvements in hormonal profile, cardiovascular health, and a reduction in disease rate. Other studies have shown that losses of around 10 kilos, or about 10%, can decrease total mortality, diabetes-related deaths, and obesity-related cancer deaths, all by a significant margin. Now, the problem that these studies outline is that these improvements rarely satisfy the wishes of patients. So this suggests to me that the claim that diets don't work for me may actually be based at least somewhat on unrealistic or more superficial expectations rather than a desire for improvements in general health. So in a society that's far too invested in external manifestations of health, you know, a slim body or defined muscles, the very important and real benefits linked with weight loss are often overlooked and dis dismissed as unimportant in favor of those more superficial benefits. Don't uh, mind my friend there. He finds his stuff fascinating. Um, so what can I do? Um, first and foremost, try not to let your weight spiral out of control. So this is helpful for absolutely everyone. Being 15 kilos overweight is worse than being 10 kilos overweight. And importantly, and what some people tend to forget is being 100 kilos overweight is worse than being 80 kilos overweight. There is really no upper limit to the damage an individual can do to their physiology with excess body weight. Now, as I've discussed uh, before, um, difficulty in losing weight and maintaining weight loss will become increasingly difficult, almost exponentially so, the more overweight an individual becomes. Now, on top of the hormonal adaptations um, I mentioned before, when people become overweight, they tend to simply move less. This might be because of um, difficulty getting around or joint pain. Um, now, of course, this isn't experienced by everyone, but it's common enough to be a significant factor. So in terms of uh, the health concerns of obesity, prevention really is definitely better than the cure. I would also advise people to focus on health. Um, I always see the best long-term results with my clients when they focus on their health in general rather than on a superficial goal, for example, a number on a scale or visibility of abs or a thigh gap or something like that. Now, these markers can be useful um, and motivating, but are certainly less important than things like reducing the risk of disease or mortality. Now, furthermore, an individual who is very obese might see certain aesthetic body goals as just too far off to be motivating. So think of the benefits I outlined before about loss of five to 10 kilos or five to 10 percent of body mass and, uh, and go from there. Finally, I would advise people to combine healthy eating and weight loss with exercise, especially strength training. Now this will allow you to maintain your lean muscle mass as you lose weight, which will have the effect of keeping your basal metabolic rate elevated. You will therefore be able to eat more calories and still continue to lose weight than if you didn't maintain that muscle mass. There is also some evidence that exercise can have a favorable effect on your hormonal profile, 
particularly in reducing insulin levels. This can further aid in weight loss. Now, yes, exercise will burn calories, but don't trust this to create a caloric deficit. As I've said many times before, our ability to consume calories far outweighs our ability to burn them. If you are someone who struggles with weight loss, please know that you are not alone. And there are professionals like myself who understand and are here to help. Thanks very much. Feed the life you want to lead. Bye.